coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. I think it's prudent to learn as much as we can before these owls become threatened or even rare. There's only one pronghorn and it's only found in North America. There's nothing like them anywhere in the world. But if this population is gone, then the natural population is gone. But we don't have it anymore in Texas. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Hi, welcome to Texas Parks and Wildlife. My name is Jonah Evans, I'm the state mammalogist. When you think of our agency, you might think of hunting, fishing, or camping in a state park. But we also employ teams of wildlife biologists and technicians who work behind the scenes to conserve non-game species of fish and wildlife. Their long hours of field work help us keep tabs on individual species and entire ecosystems. This week, we'll meet some men and women who research fish and wildlife species to keep their populations healthy for the future. Shopping strips and homes and urban expansion. It's growing just like every other place in Sunbelt areas. Urban El Paso is expanding. There's about 700,000 people in the county and we are adjacent to Mexico, Juarez, where there's at least two million people. But as more people make this region home, some other desert dwellers are being displaced. Among them are burrowing owls. That other one's still in the tree. Fortunately, biologist Lois Ballin is looking out for the owls. They are endangered in several other states, but not in Texas. Right now, there are species of concern here. They're endangered in Canada and a threatened species in Mexico. So it would be good to have a good plan for them before these owls become threatened or even rare. Burrowing owls don't live like most owls. These are terrestrial owls that live underground. These birds also borrow their burrows. They need natural areas where there are other animals like badgers or ground squirrels, rock squirrels, or prairie dogs. With the desert being encroached by urbanization, they're just losing more and more of their natural habitat. The good news is these owls can take advantage of unnatural habitat. It means I'm really not very happy that you're here. Along the Mexican border, at a natural area in eastern El Paso, Lois has been building artificial burrows for the owls since 2006. Here are some supplies you're going to need to make a burrowing owl nest box. Uh, the dog is optional. Get out of here. Send that. A reasonable size nest box, probably 16 inches high. And then we have pipes coming out, PVC pipes. That's their burrow. The whole idea here is designing the perfect, hopefully, artificial nest site for the owls that will enhance their success. All that has to be underground. OK, there you go. That will be the top. Makes it a lot faster when you have help. OK, you got it there? With her volunteer crews, Lois has installed 16 artificial burrows here. A little off. And building the burrows has presented an opportunity to study the owls more closely. So this is the camera right here. So right under this bucket is the nest box. The rocks discourage anybody from their curiosity, in case the signs aren't enough. <laughs> Two owl homes have been fitted with video surveillance systems. It's just a little camera. Three nice large solar panels providing the energy. And this little gadget here is called a solar charge controller. And this is the DVR that's going to record all the data. And having the cameras underground gives the biologists a lot of new tools. It's pretty awesome. 
may be the most impressive gadget transmits the video wirelessly, so Lois can check on the birds without disturbance or a drive across town. Okay, look at this here. These are newly hatched, and they're just little white powder puffs, I'd say one day old. Not surprisingly, the cameras are revealing much about the hidden lives of burrowing owls. Number of eggs laid, number of nestlings, their behavior or their prey items. This one looks like it might be foraging. Another mouse. They have a pretty wide variety of diet, but the main staple is rodents. They also eat birds, frogs, and lizards, and even a snake. Lois is also learning how the owls can become prey themselves. I have had coach whips go into the burrows, but fortunately the owls were smart enough not to go anywhere near that snake. I went to check a nest box, which at one point had eight eggs in it. And when I checked it, there were no eggs and there was a snake skin left behind. Probably a gopher snake ate all the eggs and then decided that was a good place to shed. But the skunk discovery is the most recent, rather astonishing discovery. Skunks are going into the burrows and occupying them, and in some cases, preying on the owls themselves. It was a shocking discovery to learn that a striped skunk would eat a burrowing owl. But this has happened two or three times now. So this is another aspect to the design of the burrows. Now I have to address how do I exclude skunks. We'll find something. Information is gathered from cameras underground with the owls, as well as from cameras outside, both artificial and natural burrows. But some kinds of knowledge can only come from hands-on research. Today, we are going to try to capture some owls and ban them. Among other things, leg bands can reveal if the same owls return each year and how long they live. I'd like to catch these guys because I know they're both adults. There's a much higher rate of survival if they've made it to adulthood. Okay. Traps are placed over burrow exits and checked throughout the morning. It's just sort of random when you're gonna catch them. There have been days I have uh, captured nothing, so any capture is a good one. We know that they hunt at night, um, but they also hunt during the day. And I also know from my videotape that they nap. So I think they're more nappers. The owls spend an awful lot of time preening and preening each other. Lots of uh, wing stretching, and leg stretching, and bobbing up and down when they sense danger. And their antics are just adorable. Hours after being set, the traps remain empty. No owls. They took the morning off. But before the day is done. We got one. Success. Do you hear that bill clattering? Not a happy camper. So we'll just take the whole trap back. None of them are happy to be trapped, but I try to be as quick as I can. When you see them at a distance, they look large and they're all puffed up. And then when you get them in your hand, you see how tiny they are. Well, this is not always graceful. I cover them first, and now he won't be afraid. Are there migrating owls just migrating through? Are there owls that come here just to breed? With an ID number, I can determine that information. So this fella is 74. 131.2, 165 on the wing One is 76. Lois collects her data quickly. This bird's ready to go. And the owl is soon on its way. There, look at that. The longer this research continues, the more it reveals about the secret lives of burrowing owls. But these owls are already increasing awareness about this urban desert habitat and the web of interconnected creatures that call it home.
it's really important in a desert environment that there are these oases for wildlife. Part of our mission is to get people outside enjoying nature. So the owl is like a representative. Some biologists call them Hollywood animals. This is a very charismatic animal that people are very attracted to. People see an owl up close, then they get appreciation for the owls and the habitat. While further research may be the best way to ensure these owls will always have a place to call home. This bird has come back two years in a row. Some extra care and compassion. Good information. Can't hurt. Okay, baby, okay. It's very difficult to work with any animal and not become attached to them, even though there's really no relationship with the owls. Just watching them grow up and watching their behavior and their antics, definitely I'm very fond of them. There's only one pronghorn and it's only found in North America. There's nothing like them anywhere in the world. My name is Sean Gray and I'm the Mule Deer and Pronghorn Program Leader for Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Sean is on a mission to solve a mystery. He and many other biologists are trying to understand why the pronghorn population in the Big Bend region of Texas took a sudden plunge. We just pulled the right kidney. Through extensive research, biologists are understanding the factors of the decline and how they interact with one another. One fact is known. Drought has definitely contributed to the problem. As part of their efforts to help supplement the population, biologists are capturing and translocating pronghorns from the Panhandle to areas just north of the Big Bend. Catching the fastest land mammal in North America is not easy. Of the 200 captured, 52 of the antelope are given satellite receiving radio collars that will help with the research. After a nine hour drive, the pronghorn are released in their new home. Trying to get into the mind of a pronghorn is very difficult. Um, however, using the new technology, the new satellite collars will help us to find in those answers that we really need. We noticed that pronghorn were concentrating or uh, would run into a fence and, and they couldn't find a passage through the fence. That animal would stay in a corner. Pronghorn will not jump a fence. They'd want to go underneath the fence. Coyotes have figured this out. This is a map of the Trans-Pecos with all of the GPS locations from the pronghorn that we translocated. This is a zoomed in image of fences and multiple animal GPS locations. So we have pronghorn locations up and down this fence line here. And when they get bunched up in a fence corner, that's when problems really start to happen. And we had several of our pronghorn get killed by coyotes in fence corners. While the satellite data from the collars showed the scientists a problem, it also helped them find a solution. Here we have a fence corner, and using our GPS collars, we observe many of our pronghorn being stuck in fence corners. And so what we did was we raised the bo bottom strand of this five-strand barbed wire fence that was originally about 12 inches off the ground to at least 18 inches off the ground to allow pronghorn to, to move freely. This fence modification keeps pronghorn from being trapped in fence corners. And that result is pronghorn can access 
more country and it's also decreased the amount of predation that's going on as well. We're learning a tremendous amount each day and uh, hopefully we're getting closer and closer and closer to finding those answers that we really need to uh, help these populations flourish again. In far west Texas, amongst the rocky and rough terrain, lies the Trans-Pecos. In this dry Chihuahuan desert region, aquatic life lives on in rivers, creeks, and cienegas. Many of these fish are only found here in the desert, adapted to survive in these harsh conditions. Because of lack of water and loss of habitat, we have a lot of fish in West Texas that are threatened. One fish in particular, the Pecos pupfish, is in serious trouble. With habitat fragmentation, loss of water, and now a new threat, hybridization, this desert dweller's existence is on the brink. Wow, this has really changed. Well, wow. I think our site is right down there. Ken Saunders has been working out here in West Texas for 27 years. And today he's out to check on the Pecos pupfish. So it looks like we have a big platform rig that's already pumping. We got this new one going in right here and our creek's running right in between it. Four or five years ago when we started working here, we'd come out here and all you could see was the creek. You can sit here and count rig after rig after rig after rig after rig. It's just really changed the landscape a lot. So we have about three miles of creek left in the whole state of Texas that has the Pecos pupfish in it. We are hoping they're still there, and so we're gonna be taking DNA samples and Shortly, we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. The Pecos pupfish is just one of 24 similar small fish that are now threatened or endangered here in West Texas. So why should we care about these little fish? They're kind of the first to go. If they go, what's next? It's part of the natural system. And every time we lose part of our natural system, we lose part of us. It's, it's our world. It's, it, if we don't take care of it, what are we going to have left? The historic home for the Pecos pupfish in Texas was the Pecos River, beginning along the New Mexico border, flowing southeast all the way to the Rio Grande. Now all the pupfish has left is a small tributary up near Pecos, Texas. Look at all those babies right there. Those are a bunch of juveniles right there. That's good. But everything's not good here in this creek. These larger fish you can see here are Gulf killifish that were introduced. They're normally in the estuaries along the Gulf Coast. Oh, got a big one. Yep. Gulf killifish. Gulf killifish. Look at that big old fat belly too. Gee, I wonder what he's been eating. The Gulf killifish is the top predator to all these Pecos pupfish. You can see they get pretty big compared to our pupfish. That's a baby pupfish right there. Obviously this fish can eat that fish and we're finding that they do. Okay. To help the pupfish, biologists do a quarterly fish count of sorts. We, uh, we go in and we try to do some seine hauls. Twist in the net right there, there we go. But once we actually uh, drag the seine through the water, we bring it up to the shore. And lift. Oh, man. Ooh Look at all those fish. And we pick out all the fish from the net, identifying which species we have, how many of each species. 10 juveniles. 15 juvies, five adults. 
10 adult two juvies. So we're trying to see how many adults we have, how many juveniles we have, so we can try and establish trends. That right there is a big adult pupfish. Female, looks like she's full of eggs. The science we're doing is really important because it gives us an idea of how the population of fish are doing. Are they declining? We wouldn't know that if we didn't come out here quarterly throughout the year to monitor the population. The biggest threat to the pupfish is another introduced minnow that's kind of like an evil twin. We have an introduced fish from the Gulf Coast called the sheep's head minnow. Very, very similar to the pupfish and they interbreed. When they do, they create hybrids that are not pure pupfish. In Texas, this is the last natural stronghold where the Pecos pupfish is still pure. It has hybridized itself and now you can't find them anymore. They keep coming out. Yep. That's just one more problem these little guys are facing in this creek. While biologists look for solutions to the non-native species here, they're also working with landowners in the Pecos region to find creeks that can serve as a new home. Until then, they're partnering with Texas zoos so the pupfish doesn't go extinct. See? Look, you see that water? Oh, I see them now. I see what we're looking for. Here at the Fort Worth Zoo, there is a captive breeding program underway. This is basically a refuge if something happens to the natural population out in Pecos. This man-made nursery ensures that the Pecos pupfish will live on. We have a couple different age groups. Um, we've got some young fry all the way up to adults and juveniles in between. In the collection, it's probably about 250 right now. Through that effort, we've been able to ensure that this fish does not go extinct if something happens to its remaining habitat. We don't want to see these fish go endangered. It would be a big loss if it were to disappear. I hate to say it, but a lot of times our job is documenting extinction. Mike, we're going to start with number 60. To see if extinction is upon us here and now, and the fish have indeed hybridized, some molecular biology is about to begin. So we're going to be taking DNA samples, and shortly we'll be able to know whether we still have that fish here or not. But if this population is gone, then the natural population, the wild population, is gone. And we don't have it anymore in Texas. As for this creek and the pupfish, it's no doubt a struggle. But these biologists provide hope. With all the, the work that we're doing, the monitoring, we hope that it's having a, a benefit to the species. You know, we're gonna continue fighting the good fight. When we came in January, we caught less than 10 or 12 total in all of our sampling. Oy. Yeah. <laughs> so for us to be able to drag two seine hauls and literally catch hundreds of juveniles, and that's a good thing. We just hope they're pure. If they're pure, then we still have a very healthy population. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to go into it and find so many numbers and see that it's still there, that it's persisting, and there is, in fact, pupfish. And, there's a lot of reproduction going on, which is a good sign. The reason I'm out here and the reason I do this, even though it's at times very disheartening to see what's happening, is because if we don't fight the battles, we won't win any at all. Through our efforts, we may be able to keep some fish alive. It's not for me to decide to throw my hands up. My job is to continue working as hard as I can to protect these fishes and these natural habitats uh, for future generations. And that's why we do what we do. We hope you enjoy seeing what some of our staff scientists do to help keep Texas wild.
Thank you for watching Texas Parks and Wildlife.